Hello and welcome to part 5 of the garden room build. Um, this last section is going to cover things like fitting the um, insulation, uh, doing the plasterboard and then finally getting the front door fitted and the rest of the cladding. As you can see behind me at last there's been some progress with the first fix electrics so I can get back on with uh, making some progress. You can see the armoured cable coming in here up to a, a junction box, consumer unit and from there <coughs> the electricians fitted the wiring for some down lighters and a series of sockets around the room. You can also see over here um, I've got a CAT5E cable uh, basically that's going to give me a link to my router in the house, a direct link so that uh, eventually I'll be able to get internet in the garden room as well. So without any more ado, the next job that I'm going to be on with is fitting the insulation panels. So for this 4 metre by 3 metre garden room, you can see the consumer unit there with the wires poking out. There's a little bit more work to do there apparently, but um, I've got the junction boxes here placed ready for the internet. Uh, a double socket with USB there and then down here some more double sockets uh, a panel there for a heater, convector heater with a fuse spur to operate it and then up here um, I'm gonna have a opportunity there for a wall mounted TV a socket with a coaxial connection there another socket down at the bottom there um, an exterior light in each corner up there and an exterior light over here all uh, coming down to some switches here the thing that's it so a double switch for the uh, exterior lights one switch for the two front ones one for the rear and then another switch down here for the four down lighters. The other thing that I've fitted as well over here is a, that's the cable going out of the building and that's for an outdoor wall socket which will help with um, you know power supply in this top corner of the garden. And so I set about putting the insulation boards uh, 90 millimeter insulation for the uh, walls and 100 millimeter insulation for the ceiling. Um, I was very careful just to make sure that when I was fitting these panels that um, I left enough of a channel around all of the electric cables as they came through the studs. So once I got the insulation panels in place, the next step was to fit a moisture barrier between the plasterboard and the uh, wall behind. This is just a, a plastic sheet that I got from a local hardware shop. Um, it's nothing special and I used a staple gun to fix it onto the um, timber battens, the uh, stud work. This is fitted to the walls as well as to the ceiling and I made little holes around the sockets so that I could get the wires to poke through. So having got the moisture barrier in place, I then set about fitting the plasterboard. The plasterboard that I used was um, a kind of tapered edge Giprock plasterboard, 12.5 millimetre thick. Um, 2400 by 1200 millimeters. I was able to use the plasterboard upright on the walls, uh, just trimming off a little bit at the top, um, and that fitted in quite nicely with the stud work that I put in that was at 400 millimeter centers, so that I was able to um, coordinate the edges of the plasterboard with the upright studs. 
Now fitting plasterboard is quite a heavy job. As you can see, I'm laboring quite a bit, just lifting the boards into the wall positions. It would have been absolutely impossible for me to put the plasterboard onto the ceiling without extra help. So I enlisted some extra help and fortunately managed to get the ceiling done um, with two of us. Uh, it is a, a job that requires a fair bit of coordination. Once you get the plasterboard in place, you need to have the drywall screws to hand and the drill to get the plasterboard fixed in place as quickly as possible. Well, you may wonder what all that knocking and banging was all about. Basically, I've got the plasterboard in position, but behind the plasterboard is a wall socket, electrical socket, and the box protrudes maybe a millimetre, two millimetres out from the line of the wall. And what I'm doing there is I'm just making a mark on the back of the plasterboard so that I can accurately cut out the position of the electric back box Having repositioned the board on the wall, it's then a case of getting it uh, secured and screwed up uh, with the drywall screws. So where are we up to now? Uh, I've just spent uh, a bit of the morning putting some scrim tape on all these joints. Uh, so that's the next job is to get uh, get some of this easy fill and start going over the joints in the plasterboard. So the plasterboard's all in. So I made a mix of easy fill, 60 minute setting drywall plaster from Giprock, I think it is and it's a nice consistency for filling in the joints and making sure that I cover the scrim tape. Uh, the scrim tape did continue to show through but I wasn't too worried as this was only the first coat. You can see I'm using a drywall um, tool here. It's a six inch uh, drywall tool. It's very flexible and I use that in preference to a standard trowel. It's not a scraper, although it looks like a scraper. It's much more flexible than that and it enables you to get the plaster on uh, and get a reasonably smooth finish. So I've got some of this um, metal edged paper tape, got it from a place called Tool Station if you're in the UK. And what you do uh, on these corners around the windows and the doors here, I just put a bit of uh, easy fill down each, each uh, angle and then you fold this up and fold down the middle where the two bits of metal are like that and then just offer it up. And that forms your corner bead. Just bed it into the um, into the plaster, all the way down, and then I'm going to just give it a quick first top coat, and then I guess after I've done that, it's all dry. I'll put a second coat on. So I get my uh, mix of easy fill. I'm just going to go down that edge, all the way down, and the same over here. So here we are, uh, just done the um, sanding down after putting the first. Um, application of 
easy fill on, I think I've got easy fill 60, so it takes about an hour to go off. So that was a couple of days ago, it's all dried out now. Um, and I've sanded it down, so I think the screw holes are okay, but there's still some work to do on these um, major joints here. You can probably see, um, like here, areas where the scrim tape is showing through. So it needs a second coat, so that's what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, so other than that, that's the, uh, that's the object for today. I found that doing the corners is quite difficult. A little bit untidy, but hopefully I'll get that caught today. Try and sort that out. And the paper, um, the, the paper corners with the steel band reinforcement, I found that if you don't have enough mix on the wall, you end up with little blisters. For the most part, it's 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 stuck down pretty well, like there, but then just occasionally it'll miss. So it's a case now of uh, maybe cutting that little bit of paper out of there and then just plastering over it. So for those little blisters on the edge beading there, I just cut out the sections that were blistered. Obviously I couldn't cut out the metal strip behind the bit of paper, but the edge paper that was uh, loose, I managed to just cut those little sections out. And for the most part, uh, that was successfully filled in with the second coat of plaster. There was one bead uh, next to the window frame on one side where I decided to just pull the whole bead off and start again. But it wasn't too drastic and uh, I managed to uh, achieve a reasonably successful result. So here I'm just taking my time putting on the second coat, which I think is going to be sufficient judging by the um, finished result. I'm using a standard plasterer's um, trowel here um, just to get a reasonably good consistent finish. Just taking my time doing the edges and the corners and those uh, gaps between the plasterboard. I was quite happy with the fact that uh, on the second coat I managed to get rid of any signs of the scrim tape underneath. As far as I understand with this drywall technique, it's just a case of putting the plaster on over the joints to build up the surface to cover the joint, but then fading the plaster out over the um, grey coloured top surface of the plasterboard there. So you're not actually covering the whole plasterboard as you would if you were doing a, a complete um, skin. It's just a case of fading the plaster um, as you fill out the joints. Quite hard doing the corners, but I found if you've got a damp sponge, um, you can actually just run run your sponge along and smooth out any irregularities, and then use your trowel just to finish off. Um, so that that helps to just smooth out those corner details, which I found quite difficult, really. 
However, um, it's all good. This was an awkward corner around that flue pipe, but I've got it done at last. So it's all going to dry now, uh, and I'll be waiting now to get it dry and then paint up. All these these little window details again. Um, start of the day this morning, I had um, to redo the um, metal corner bead, the metal strip that's got paper on it and that's turned out a lot better this time and there is where I've cut out the um, where I've cut, cut out the, the, the bits of paper they've just filled in with this second coat and again what I've done here just to just at the very end of the process I'm going to sponge and really vigorously wash and rub into these corners so that the um, the plaster sort of got, got taken off the timber but also it's kind of smoothed it out as well so a wet sponge, well a kind of like damp sponge seems to work quite well so tools I've used standard plasterer's trowel um, for the bulk of the work a six inch drywall trowel uh, a bucket trowel to get the plaster out of the bucket a corner detail trowel which uh, proved useful for getting all the corners and the edges done but most of all the sponge at the end just to clean up all those edges um, and all the corners dipped in a bucket of water then sort of squeezed out but leaving some moisture in it and then um, smoothing everything down and then maybe going over it with uh, one or other of these trowels here. Well yesterday was a big day in terms of progress with the uh, build. Had these doors installed, these lovely oak patio doors uh, by Jacob Paul, bespoke woodwork and stone walling. He's a local craftsperson, lives less than a mile from here. Um, and what he's done is fitted the doors in such a way that I can now get on with the cladding and um, he's left like a kind of rebate on the edge of the frame so that when I put the cladding on it'll oversail the edge here and butt up against the uh, oak frame of the door. So that's what I'm going to get on with today. As I already had a wood burning stove that I got um, second hand locally and refurbished, I decided to recite it and put it in the summer house. Now I'm not going to give too much details about how I went about doing this because it is safety critical. You do need to be able to put a wood burning stove in correctly and safely to meet the various regulations that apply. Obviously my garden room is entirely, well, substantially built of timber and combustible items, so I had to make sure that I complied with regulations as far as I could. Anyway, this is a very brief overview of how I went about it. So I started off by building a concrete hearth on top of the existing concrete floor. I then got hold of some quarry tiles, made a mix of tile cement and then started to um, cover the hearth with these quarry tiles. I made the hearth in such a way that the quarry tiles would fit evenly so that the spacing would fit across the, um, uh, the area that I made out of the concrete. I used little bits of MDF, 7mm I think, MDF uh, as tile spacers. Having got the hearth completed, I then set about making a heat shield. This is made from one and a half millimeter galvanized steel sheet, which I um, cut using an angle grinder with a thin blade. You'll notice I'm wearing gloves 
and safety mask for this because of the um, risk uh, from all the hot sparks. In order to make sure that the heat shield stood off the wall a bit, um, I made some little spaces from uh, sections of copper pipe and I'm using a standard um, copper pipe cutter which uh, you'd normally find in a plumber's toolbox to make these little spaces that enable me to separate the heat shield from the actual wall behind. So having got the heat shield um, bolted to the wall, uh, I then lifted the stove onto the fire hearth and mocked up the uh, flue pipe to work out exactly where the stove was going to need to penetrate through the ceiling and the roof above. Having established exactly where I needed to um, exit the ceiling, I drilled a hole through from below and then marked out on the roof the diameter that I needed for the flue pipe to come out as well as giving clearance around the flue pipe to meet the, um, uh, the requirements for um, proximity to combustibles. It's then a bit of a leap of faith as you take your jigsaw and cut a huge disc out of your pristine EPDM covered roof and watch that disc fall down to the floor below. Here it goes. Kerplunk. <laughs> so there's no going back from here. It's a case of uh, just hoping that everything works out. Um, my... Having got the hole in the ceiling sorted out, I then decided to get on with the um, fitting the flue. That involved using fire cement and some gasket to fit the flue pipe into the top of the stove and then bolting the flue pipe onto the various brackets that go up through the, the up, up through the wall and up through the ceiling and out through the top and then finally fitting the EPDM roof flashing. So with the stove pipe secured and sticking out of the roof I then went up on the roof and measured up for fitting the um, EPDM flashing. I made sure that the EPDM roofing material was clean by using methylated spirits in this case just to get rid of any uh, hint of grease or debris in the area that, that I'm going to apply the mastic. I used two types of mastic. Uh, one was a compression mastic which um, went underneath the flashing and another one was a lap sealant which went round the edge of the, of the uh, roof flashing. I secured the roof flashing with a number of bolts uh, of, uh, which went through the roof into the sterling board below and each of these little bolts had uh, an EPDM washer. This does look like a DIY job doesn't it? Oh, I've used this tool here to just put a little um, chamfer around the edge which seems to have worked quite well. It's sticky enough stuff so hopefully that'll keep the water out. Right, gotta, gotta evacuate the roof, it's gonna rain. And these are the bits and bobs that I used for fitting the flue pipe into the top of the stove and also the roof flashing. Well here's the stove in place. You can see a little air vent down on the left hand side there and the um, heat shield and then the stove exiting the ceiling and on the outside the cladding's all finished and there you've got the um, flue pipe extending well over a metre beyond the uh, top of the roof. As it does get quite windy around here I use an extra strong bracket to join two bits of flue pipe on the outside. Well, as you can see, we're getting there bit by bit. Um, if you found any interest or value in this uh, video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, it helps with the YouTube algorithm. 
Uh, and if you want to see more of DIY and other stuff, particularly the um, final stages of the garden room build, please consider subscribing um, and then you'll see the updates as we go along. Hopefully um, not so far to go now, just the um, floor tiles to put in and some painting and decorating to do. So see you next time, thanks for looking in.